our first speaker today is, Dr. is uh, Randy Simmons, who's a senior fellow at the Independent Institute, professor of economics and director of the Institute for P of Political Economy at Utah State University's John Huntsman School of Business, and former mayor of Providence, Utah. He received his PhD in political science from the University of Oregon, and he's a member of the board of directors at the Utah League of Cities and Towns, and a member of the Utah Governor's Privatization Commission. Professor Simmons' books include the award-winning Beyond Politics, Aquanomics, and the Political Economy of Culture and Norms, a contributing author to, numerous, to various volumes, such as Rethinking Green, Alternatives to Environmental Bureaucracy. He is the author of scholarly articles that have appeared in numerous journals, and his popular articles have been published in newspapers and magazines across the United States. So, please welcome Dr. Simmons. Yeah. Carl, that introduction reminds me that I don't have a copy of Aquanomics yet. <laughs> we'll remedy that oversight. Uh, okay, great. I am a uh, walking contradiction in some ways, in that what I study public choice, which is the simple explanation is that it's the application of uh, economic thinking to political choices. Uh, another definition is that it is the application is the study of government failure. Uh, some people claim that if economics is the dismal science, then public choice is the dismal science squared, because uh, you're, you're taking the ideas from economics and applying them somewhere else and just making, I, I, just seeing how bad things are. Uh, by the way, the dismal science line has been misapplied. It was used by Malthus when there were economists telling him that he was wrong. But uh, that's just an aside. I went to graduate school, and my very first day in graduate school, I hear these people talking about public choice. I thought, what in the world are they talking about? Oh, excuse me, I should probably take my hat off. We are indoors. <laughs> uh, and we, I kept hearing this phrase, public choice. Until someday, one day it just finally hit me. I was in the elevator and going up to the ninth floor of the Prince Lucian Campbell Hall building at the University of Oregon, and it suddenly hit me, wait a minute, economics is the study of private choices. Public choice is the study of public choices. I'm slow, I'm sorry, I just am. And I, as I've gotten older, I've, I've gotten much, much slower. So what we want to talk about is public choice. And the way I want to talk about it is by comparing differences in how public choices are made and private choices are made. So we have these parallel systems that people use for achieving their goals. People try and get what they want through markets or they try and get what they want through politics. And as much as we would prefer many, you know, people like me who are at best small government types, uh, we would prefer that people weren't using the political system to achieve, to get things they want, they do. So, uh, and the fact that I spent 10 years in city government tells you something about the, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm just, when, I, when you really come right down to it, I am pretty much a pragmatist. Uh, and I separate my hopes for how things work with my expectations of how things will work. Uh, I always hope that people will act better in politics than they do. But I don't, ex I don't expect them actually to. Oops. I'll figure out this computer. One of the hallmarks of markets is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs are people who are scanning the horizon, looking for opportunities. Uh, even maybe opportunities that, well clearly opportunities that other people haven't recognized. The uh, Israel Kirshner talked about there being a uh, $20 bill on the ground that everybody steps over and only the entrepreneur sees it and picks it up recognizing that there's an opportunity to do something that other people haven't. Now, 
I, I put this slide up just because th the entrepreneur I know most, best, is my father. And my father got through high school because my mother did his homework for him. Uh, he never went to college. He, uh, he was a dairy herdsman. He, worked, he, he milked other people's cows for them. Uh, once he stopped doing that, he started trimming cows' feet. You didn't know that there was a, a market for cow pedicurists, did you? <laughs> but in fact, that's what he did for a long time. And that's how I, actually how I put myself through college, was working with cows. And just as, so you know, I hate cows. I really, truly do hate cows. Uh, I, I remember standing in a loading chute when I was eight years old and telling one of my friends, I'm not milking cows when I grow up. But so this father of mine who had, was doing cow stuff uh, was in 1969, he went to visit his brother in Las Vegas and put a few quarters in a slot machine and won $250 and was smart enough to leave. Now in 1969, $250 was worth, you know, about 125. Uh, from what it had been worth. But anyway, worth a lot more than it is today. He came home and he had this windfall and he purchased a snowmobile. And it was a used snowmobile, uh, but he just got completely hooked in the sport. So then he started thinking, how do you make the sport better? Well, in 1994, he woke up one day, opened his journal and said, I had a dream last night on making a plastic ski. And so he did. I won't give you the whole story of how it ended up here, but uh, it was the first plastic ski on the market. It w actually completely revolutionized skis. Also, however, we have public entrepreneurs. And I choose Henry V on purpose because I both love and hate Henry. I don't know if you've read uh, the play or if you've watched the Kenneth Branagh version of the movie, the, it, it's just wonderful. The reason I say I love and hate Henry, one is I just admire his ability to manipulate people. <laughs> he's really good at it. And the reason I hate Henry is because he's so good at manipulating people uh, for his own ends and takes people off to France to die for really Henry's glory. Um, One of the things to remember about people in markets and people in politics is they're the same people. You know, when I would walk into the city council offices in my cowboy hat and take it off and put on my mayor hat, there wasn't something magic that happened between my ears that made me suddenly love everyone else. And when you go vote, the same thing doesn't happen. You don't walk into the, of course, you're probably smart enough to, to not vote. But the people who do vote, <laughs> when they go into the polling place and vote, they're the same person that was in the line at Safeways. So you're in a line waiting for the voting booth. You're in a line waiting for your food at Safeways. You're the same person. You're, you're thinking the same kinds of things. You are a self-interested person who's the, the difference is the incentives that you face when you're voting are far different than the incentives that you face when you're buying something at Safeway. You know, did you know the people at Safeway love me? And here's how I can tell. I can walk in any Safeway anywhere in the country and go back to the cookie aisle and there are mint Milanos on the shelf. Maybe even the double mint Milanos, double chocolate mint. <laughs> they truly love me. They always have them there for me. In politics, I don't think anybody loves me. <laughs> In the sense that the only time politicians do something for me is when they want my vote. And the vote of other people like me. So the, the point is, there are different incentives, but there we are the same people. So when you go purchase something, you're voting with your money. So how many of you have smartphones? 
All of you? All of you? Uh, which kind do you have? Android. You have, a, you have an Android? iPhone. You have an iPhone, so we got uh, trying to figure out if you have iPhone Envy or not. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you thought about it really seriously, right? Do I get an, a, do I get an Android phone? Do I get, a, do I get a, an iPhone? And what are the features? And un, unless you're just not like any, most people, I bet you thought about it a lot. Why did you choose the Android? Because I also had a tablet that is, uh, is Android, so I, mean, I got to get a, 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 an Android phone. Why did you get the iPhone? Is on the plan. <laughs> you just got sucked into it. <laughs> but you didn't have to spend it that much. You could have gotten something else. We think about it. We try and figure out what's going to make us the most happy, and we act on it. We even have different amounts of money to spend on our purchases. So I was, I was just looking. I have an Android. I'm thinking of, of changing to an iPhone <laughs> right now. With Verizon, it would cost me $150, and for my wife's phone, if we didn't get, if we got the 4, not the 4S, because she doesn't need Siri, uh, it's $50 for her. So we have this sort of budget. We figure out what our budget is, and then, then we're going to spend it. At the ballot box, you get one vote, just one. You can't spend. Well, you can't decide. Well, I'm going to spend 200 votes on this politician and five on that politician. You get one vote. And you might think, well, of course you only get one vote. Well, it does affect the way things happen is by only having one vote. See, if you pay for Coca-Cola, that's what you get. You get Coke. Except in some restaurants, yes, for Coke, and they bring you Pepsi. And you then, so then my response is, well, you brought me fake Coca-Cola. Can I pay you with Monopoly money? Good morning. But you put your money in a machine, you get Coca-Cola. You, at the, at the grocery store, you pick up the, the bottle of Coke, you set it on the counter, you pay, and you get it. When you vote, however, you only get what you wanted if 50% of the other voters agree with you. It takes 50% plus one. Unless you're running for mayor in Oakland, and Oakland has a, an instant runoff system, and it's complex to describe, but uh, it, it's, it's, we won't worry about it. We'll just use the standard voting idea. You only get what you want if enough, if enough others vote with you. So you compare your prices, you buy what you want. As a voter, however, you can plan on somebody else paying for what you want. Especially some rich other person to pay for what you want. Um, And so while the benefits of your Coca-Cola are yours, the benefits of, what po of political goods, the, the benefits are visible to you. You see the new road. You see the new dam. You see the new social program. You see the concert in the park. But does anybody ever hold up how much it costs? That's all hidden. When you, if you look at your plan, you know what you paid. <laughs> you know your benefits of your iPhone, you also know the costs. You know the benefits of your Android, you know also know the costs. Um, now, in a normal world, we have budgets in the private world. So, I'm, I did this with books and movies. Mike Munger at Duke does it with Guns and Roses. Uh, but if I spend 
all of my money on books, I have nothing left to buy for movies. If I spend all my money on movies, I have nothing left to buy books. So there are all these trade-offs. Figure out, well, how many books do I really want and what does that cost me in terms of movies? Uh, we see these trade-offs. In politics, however, trade-offs are just not real. He will say, no new taxes, don't, no new taxes. And you see old people doing this. Don't increase our taxes, but increase our Social Security. One of the greatest moments in American political commentary happened on The Simpsons. I mean, if you really want to see great political commentary, you watch The, you watch the Simpsons in South Park. Uh, far better than anything else that's on TV. But uh, Grandpa Simpson qualifies for Social Security, <laughs> and obviously then Medicare. And he goes down to the, uh, to the government office, and he stands on the desk, and he says, give me, give me, give me. <laughs> well, he's not. What he paid in is this tiny fraction of what he's going to get, because you're all paying up. Thank you very much. Uh, the opportunity costs of expanding a government program are simply not visible to you. And if, if you pay, you're paying one tiny fraction of the cost. So if you could, you know, if I were only paying a tiny fraction of what this cost, I'd have one for every room. Which is one reason we have government doing so many things that we would, might prefer they wouldn't. So I, I use the example of the phone. You have a strong incentive to figure out, do you want an iPhone? Do you want a droid? Voters, on the other hand, have very, very little interest or incentive in really gaining good information. Some do. There are nuts. They tend to be libertarians. <laughs> People who really do study and find out about the, the, the politicians and their positions as if they were actually ever going to be carried out. Um, but your chances of affecting the outcome of an election are functionally zero. That's why I said if you, if you do vote, you got to have a reason other than trying to affect the outcome of the election. It, they're essentially zero. But some people still vote. But it's doubtful that they spend very much time figuring out important things about their, their candidates. It's, it's very rational to be ignorant of a lot of the, what the politician has to, to say. Uh, so it's, it's, rational to, it's rational to be ignorant, but they can also be really irrational voters in the sense they vote for things that they wouldn't vote for if they thought they were the person being the decider. But since they're not the decider, we can, I can vote about, I can vote for something, let's, let's increase the restaurant tax so that we can have a, so that our local zoo will continue to function. Sandwiches, zoos. There's a really tight connection there, right? Uh, even though they would never give to the zoo themselves, they might be voting to have other people give to the zoo. One, th one reason that people vote is simply they feel good. You, know, you get the little sticker to put, put on yourself, the I voted sticker. And you just feel so darn good because you've done your civic duty. You're happy. Or you feel good that you voted against that bastard. Another reason for voting is, is just to cheer. I 
I have a. I have to confess, I'm a Yankees fan. <laughs> and there's sometimes that Joe Girardi drives me nuts. Who's Joe Girardi? <laughs> He's the manager of the Yankees, and he sometimes he he leaves the pitcher in I think too long, or. He takes him out too soon. And so Girardi gets up out of the dugout and walks out onto the diamond. I'm sitting in my living room in Utah, screaming at him. Can he hear me? No. But I scream anyway. Or I really like college basketball. College basketball can be really fundamentally sound good basketball to watch, <coughs> unlike the uh, a uh, slightly edited version of pr professional wrestling that we have in the NBA. But I like to go. I like to cheer. I like to help make all that noise. Do you think when the entire crowd is standing cheering that my voice has any effect? No, they can't hear me. Everybody else is cheering, but I feel good about it. I, it just There's an emotional thing about having cheered. So one, one way of thinking about voting is that it, it, it's a way of expressing yourself the same way that cheering at a football game or a basketball game or in the confines of your living room make you feel good. So uh, there is a whole literature about expressive voting. <coughs> Coming back to these entrepreneurs. A private entrepreneur has to, is, tries to figure out what it is that people want. Now, you'll notice that this particular snowmobile has all of these yellow highlights in it. The rest is all hidden by the snow. The guy is obviously a, uh, a snowmobile fashionista because he's, he's got the yellow and black on his helmet and on his, uh, uh, I'm sure, on the bibs on the coat. So my dad said, why, do we, why are all skis black? Why don't we make them colors? And this is one of the earliest colored skis. And so they're able, people are able to put skis on that match their sled. Is that cute? But they want them. And so dad has to figure out, how many are going to want them? How badly do they want them? How much are they willing to pay? Now, as a politician, you just ask, well, how many people want it? Can I get 50% plus one? And without putting prices on political goods, there's just no way to value, to, to figure out the value people actually put on what it is you're doing. My first night as mayor, there was the city council room is a little bit larger than this room. The place was packed, overflowing. What is this? There were about 30 people there who were upset about a, a zoning decision that was allowing property to go from being uh, an orchard that hasn't produced anything in 50 years to, to being a, a subdivision. And they were there screaming and yelling and making all kinds of noise. Now, how does the council measure if that's, if that's indicative of the whole city? I mean, you can do a survey, but a survey doesn't tell you how intensely people feel about it. It doesn't measure intensity at all. But deciding how much you're going to spend on your phone tells you how intensely you feel about that phone. There just isn't a way in politics to know how intensely people feel about things. We just see how many people. Now, I know we're going to talk uh, about markets, but I'm going to just do a quick aside about the value of prices. People ask, well, what are prices? Well, yeah, they're the dollar amount on purchasing something, but they're far more than that. Prices are condensed information. They just tell us if something's more scarce or less scarce. And Michelle's heard this example before, but I'm going to give it anyway. 
because it's, it, it's one of my favorite. Pencils. The very best wooden pencils are made of Port Orford cedar, produced in the Pacific Northwest. They're great pencils, and they smell good when you sharpen them. But if all of a sudden the price of wooden pencils, Port Orford cedar pencils, go up, what does it tell you? For some reason, it's more expensive to make them. Now, and so the price goes up, and it tells you, well, you may want to switch to some inexpensive big pen. Or to a mechanical pencil, if you insist on not using ink. But you should switch, because these are now much more expensive. Now, it may be that they're more expensive because there was a Holocaust-type fire that went through and wiped out all of the uh, Port Orford cedar trees. It may be that there is now an endangered spotted owl who has taken up residence. And uh, so under the Endangered Species Act, you can't affect that, the owl's habitat, so you can't have access to the trees. Or it may be that some other, for some other reason, like a, uh, an activist named Butterfly has chained herself to, to Port Orford cedar trees and decided to live in the trees, she and her friends, so that they can't be cut down. You don't need to know if it's, if it's butterfly, if it's fire, or if it's an endangered species. All you need to know is the price goes up, and that affects your choices. Prices are really magic. They're the closest thing we have, I think, to magic. Uh, so what, next time you're reading a fantasy novel, Think about, well, the magic of prices. I know, you're probably unlikely to do it. Now, the, I use this, uh, the arrows here because arrows, there is a, a particular kind of tree that wooden arrows are, makes by far and away the best wooden arrows. So, but votes, however, as I mentioned, they don't measure intensity. And you can have 49% of the people just strongly opposing something. And 51% saying, ah, I think it's OK. So 49% oppose having a nuclear power plant built near them or anywhere. And 51 say, ah, it's OK. Well, the 49% get what they didn't want even though they felt intense about it. They felt really strongly about it. Uh, by the way, the, that city council meeting that I mentioned, there is a, a technical phrase for what those people were doing. It's called public clamor. And under law, in, at least in Utah, you're supposed to ignore public clamor. You're supposed to just follow what your ordinances say, regardless of all of the noise that's being made in your, in your city council chambers. It's really hard for city councils to ignore public clamor, because it's loud. Um, one, of the, one of the people who was at that meeting was a there are two different pieces that had been rezoned for housing. One of them was a 20-acre piece that had that the owners took a couple of crops of alfalfa hay off of it, and then the rest of the year grazed horses on it. And they didn't; these weren't just sort of broomtail ugly horses. They owned really good-looking horses, and sometimes you'd see the horses pick up their heads and gallop across the field and their tails streaming behind them. And they're gorgeous. Well, the guy sitting, who owned the property next to them talked about that, about how important it was to him to be able to sit on his porch and watch these horses run. And that we were taking away something really valuable and important by allowing houses to be there. 
So he wanted to you know, continue to grow alfalfa and horses as opposed to growing children. Uh, but he, he could see all of the benefits of keeping it zoned the way it was. But really, the co the, there were no costs to him. And in politics, that's just the way many things are. We only see the benefits. We don't see the costs. And you know, the cost was this developer, and everybody hates a developer, right? We know that they're evil people. We just know it. So it's not cost. It, in fact, it feels good to stop a developer. So the benefits of keeping that land as in agriculture would be concentrated on those few people around it. The costs, well, now have less land in the city that can be developed, which means you're going to drive up housing prices for everybody who comes into the city. Anybody who wants to build a new home, the land is now more scarce, so it's going to cost more. All of those costs get dispersed. The people who continue to watch the horses are just so happy. Uh, I said to him, well, why don't, if it's that valuable, why don't you just buy it? He said, well, I don't have that much money. And my response was, they make banks. And suggested that the, the people who wanted that kept open should form their own little corporation, take a loan, buy it, and leave it, that, leave it the way it was. And their response was, well, you're just in the pocket of the developers. Uh, they wanted the benefits. They didn't want to have to pay for them. And that's really typical. Now, <laughs> I put the picture up here of uh, cane sugar because, uh, see, any of you drink uh, regular Coca-Cola, you know, not the diet stuff, anyone, anyone? Have you, have you had one in Mexico? No. Anyone had one in Mexico? What's the difference? Made with cane sugar, not corn syrup. How does it taste? <laughs> is, is that your re reaction too? Do you like it better? You have? Yeah. And you like it better? Well, the U.S. sugar industry lobbies Congress to protect them against Mexicans <coughs> and Dominicans and Cubans. They, ha they have to be protected against all of those people because, not because they have brown skins, but because they're, they're producing cane sugar that would compete with theirs and would drive down the price that people pay for cane sugar. So because of those tariff barriers, we, you and I spend, depending at the time, two to four times the world price for sugar. And corn syrup is cheaper than that high price sugar, so that's why we get corn syrup in, in Coca Cola. Um yeah, we have we do have all kinds of farm subsidies that some of which can, uh, contribute to reducing the cost of growing corn. Uh, one of the things we have are the ethanol mandates that so you can grow corn and they have to take it. But Two to four times the price of the world price of sugar, and you can't get a decent Coca-Cola. Well, you can if you go to some of the like some of the Hispanic specialty shops, and they've brought it up, pay, and you have to pay a bunch more for it. But you can actually taste what Coke really is supposed to taste like. Costco. <laughs> oh, you can do it at Costco. By the case. By the case. Cool. Do it. <laughs> Join Costco. <laughs> but the benefits of the sugar tariffs are all, all go to the sugar producers. And the costs are paid by all of us. And, and sometimes it's not just dollar costs, it's taste costs. It's costs that we, we truly don't recognize. So if you're a politician, you need to remember why people vote. 
They vote, they're rationally ignorant. They want to do their civic duty. They're doing it kind of to cheer. So, you need to figure out how do you get them to like you enough. So what you're going to watch, if you watch any, any television with advertisements in the next several months, is you're going to watch political advertisements. And very few of them are going to say anything of substance. There'll be the ones that try to scare you about the opponent. And negative advertising, actually, we, we see so much negative advertising because it actually works. It's easier to scare people than it is to make them feel good. It's just, you know, if you scare, you, you have somebody who's rationally ignorant, who's going to vote anyway, and you can somehow scare them a little bit, that may be what decides how they vote. For the positive ads, the politicians aren't going to say anything. They will say that they're in favor of families or children. Well, who's not in favor of families or children? Now, definitions of families may, be, may differ, but they're not going to talk about that. They're going to do all they can to make you think they're a nice person so that you have positive feelings about them. The senior senator from Utah is Orrin Hatch. I told you this story too, but you'll get it a second time. Orrin Hatch, when he first ran for Congress, was a, he would be a Tea Partier today. He was brash. He was somewhat obnoxious. He was full of vim and vigor and fire. And he took on Ted Kennedy all the time uh, in, in committee meetings. And uh, the Democrats in the state of Utah thought, well, let's unseat him. It was the first time maybe ever that Utah had, had uh, senators from both party, from only one party. There'd always been a Democratic senator and, senator and a Republican senator, and Orrin Hatch took away this, the Democratic seat. So six years on, time for him to run for re-election. He has this reputation of being a bulldog, and only a certain number of people like bulldogs. So they thought, let's run something, someone against him who's completely the opposite. And they chose Ted Wilson, who was mayor of Salt Lake City, uh, a rock climber, a family man, a really, truly nice guy. Everybody knows that Ted Wilson is a nice guy. So what's the Hatch campaign going to do? Well, they changed voters' perceptions about Orrin Hatch. The way they did it is they did this massive ad campaign in April, well before normal campaign season for Senate races. And it wasn't saying, vote for Orrin Hatch, don't vote for uh, Wilson. What his staff did was they worked him really hard in Washington, D.C just meeting after meeting after meeting. And a lot of them were meaningless, pointless meetings, so they just wore him out. They put him on the very latest pl fl plane flight to Salt Lake and had a staff member sit by him and talk to him the whole time, keeping him awake. He gets to Salt Lake. He gets about three hours of sleep, and they have him up to put him on a little tiny airplane to fly all over the state, different stops, different places, giving his campaign speeches. By the time he gets back to Salt Lake City, he is truly worn out. And they put him in a recording studio, and they let him lie down on this sofa, kind of like a psychiatrist sofa. <laughs> they let him lie down, and they just start asking him questions and do sort of stream of consciousness with him, and his voice changes. He's tired. His voice doesn't have an edge to it. It's the tired Orrin Hatch. And he talks about his family, and he talks about America, and he talks about what a wonderful place it is. And they just, they had this series of questions for him, and he just did this whole stream of consciousness in his really tired, mellow, likable voice. 
Then they matched all of that with, picture, with, uh, uh, w w with TV ads, one showing him and his sons walking up the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and standing there in front of Mr. Lincoln. And in the, the background, you hear Orrin talking about how wonderful Abraham Lincoln was, how wonderful the USA is. Not one thing about policy. My favorite one of those ads was he's standing in the kitchen with a bowl of popcorn next to his wife. Now in Utah, Monday nights, the, the LDS church says, you sh spend Monday nights with your family. And they even made these manuals for do having little lessons and activities with your family. And they're, they were a particular color, a shape, size. Well, one of those, or at least one that looks exactly like it, is sitting there on the counter. So this is Oren and his wife getting ready for family home evening. And he's talking about family. And he picks up a piece of popcorn and tosses it into the air. And what appears in, the, in your view is a little dog. And he gets the piece of popcorn and goes back down to the floor. Oren Hatch even loves dogs. Again, no policy. So when you, when you see ads that insult you that way, when you actually want to hear some substance, you know you're not going to get them because you're not the kind of voter they, they're talking to. They're talking to those who are actually likely to vote. <laughs> they're talking to the rationally ignorant, well-meaning voter. See why I said it's the dismal science squared? Um, there's a reason candidates kiss babies. Yeah, that's one of my favorite G.W. Bush pictures. So if you're a politician, you should make emotional appeals. You need to reduce ideas to slogans just so that people can get them really easily. And you, you want to mobilize your base. Those who are most likely to support you, you got to turn them out first. Now, that I had, the picture I had up there was uh, Mr. Chavez, who's really good at reducing ideas to slogans. He's really good at making emotional appeals one of the best we've seen in the last few decades. Uh, watch your politicians. They're going to do the same kind of thing because they know how it is that people are likely to vote. Now, another implication is that politicians are likely to pass, they pass legislation in order to get election, elected. They don't get elected in order to pass legislation. So you make promises and you, make, you do symbolic things as a legislator, like Superfund. I love this. Success stories in 2006. Superfund is in a colossal waste of money. A colossal waste of money, but it's all for the children. And so the symbols may be far more important than actually accomplishing anything. A symbol like this. We took care of this super, super fun site. You don't talk about the costs, but it, you, what you want is to make people believe that their vote for you counts and that voting, voting is going to benefit them. And you're going to, as a politician, you're going to emphasize the benefits, not the cost. Now, this is the Hoover Dam on the uh, Columbia River. Uh, It's magnificent as an engineering marvel. It really is good at stopping salmon from going any further to spawn. <laughs> we could have gotten all the hydroelectric benefits we want out of that dam with a low dam, which would have made it easier for salmon to get by, but built the high dam. And the reason for the high dam, I'm getting trapped. The reason for the high dam is that clear up there above the dam is the is farmland that was not irrigated. 
So build the high dam, then you lift water up even higher and spread it out on that farmland. And what they did in this case was uh, veterans from World War II got first pick at the land. They could get, I don't remember, it was like a Homestead Act. I don't remember if it's 120 acres or 160 is the normal homestead number. But I, was, I just had like a little question on the side. Is, is, if the dam is deeper, doesn't that mean that there is like more pressure at the bottom and you'd get more electricity, electricity out of it? Um, I don't understand how, I, I, I don't know. But the, all of the studies I've seen show that we would get as, as much electricity from a low dam as we do from a high dam without the cost of the high dam and the ex, you know, all of the other costs. But one, one reason for the high dam is just to raise water up so that to irrigate land and then they don't charge the, anything near the cost of, of the pumping costs. And so I, I did a study more than 20 years ago and I think we were subsidizing that land at about the rate of $5,000 a year when you figure in the cost, the, if you t start to amortize any of the costs. Uh, but people don't see those costs, they just see the benefits of spreading that water out on the Palouse in Washington. Uh, and by the way, people, people aren't dumb. Politicians tend to think you can just move people around. They, they said, you can move onto this land, but you, have to, you can't sell it for market price if you ever move. You have to sell it at this low price. Well, my farm is for sale. It's for sale at the government price. However, in order to buy my farm, you have to buy my horse. And look at this old horse. He doesn't have any teeth. He's about ready to die, but I love him so dearly that I need you to pay me an extra $70,000 for the horse. There are always ways around rules of that sort. But, by the way, this is uh, Gerald Ford when he was a park ranger. Uh, what do bureaucrats do? Four groups of people to think about in politics. Politicians, bureaucrats, voters, and interest groups. So here we have bureaucrats. Do we think they maximize the public interest? Now, not only was I a politician, I'm a state bureaucrat. I teach at a state school. So, you know, if, if I ever come knocking at your door, you should not open it. Politician, bureaucrat. <laughs> uh, why, would, why would we assume that they maximize the public interest rather than the in, their own interests? rather than their prestige, maximize their ideology. You can't do any of that unless you maximize your budget. Prestige, ideology. Your budget. Budgets really, really matter. Because you can't do any of the other stuff you want to do unless you get the budget. So how do I get the budget? Well, it used to be in the Forest Service that the way you got budget for managing grizzly bears was you cut a whole bunch of timber and you were able to keep a part of those receipts and put it into your grizzly bear fund. So in order to protect bears, you cut trees. Uh, there are lots of interesting things that happen. But one of the constraints that is one of the areas in which bureaucrats are quite unconstrained is in creating regulation. They can create regulations that affect you, that cost you, and cost them nothing. And they often don't ever see the effects of those regulations on normal people. So they get to feel good about the regulation. We're doing good things in the world. They impose costs. They never see the costs like this. These are the Delta smelt. Uh, fairly well known in the LA area because they are affecting whether or not farmers can continue to pump water or it's going to kill 
the, this endangered species. Another problem with bureaucrats is that we don't face any sort of market constraint that disciplines our actions. You know, if my father produces an ugly ski that no one buys, that's a constraint. If a, bureau if a bureaucrat produces an ugly regulation, okay. Uh, this little image is taken from the web page of uh, uh, Bureaucrash. Don't know if you know Bureaucrash, but they're they do pretty interesting things. They can create log lots of costs, lines, rules that make no economic sense, like the rules about uh, um, washing machines. If you're buying, I know you're probably not in the market for a new washing machine. If you're buying a new washing machine, however, buy a front loader, not a top loader, because the regulations on the top loaders have made them so they don't hard, they, they, you have to wash twice in order to clean your clothes. Because you're supposed to, they, they use less water, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that they had to do in order to meet the regulations. But the regulations didn't have anything about actually cleaning clothes. Public interest groups and private interest groups, I don't think we should expect them to maximize the public interest either. Because how do you even know what the public interest is if you can't charge prices? Um, and we have all kinds of private interests getting in these public products like, it's really important for us to produce biofuel. Well, who does it help? Which interests are pushing it? Uh, a public interest group gets to maximize ideology and push it really hard. Um, again, costs are dispersed, benefits are concentrated, ideology gets imposed. It's a wonder that any of it works at all. That's why I say dismal science squared. Public choice simply takes the ideas of economics and says, number one assumption, we're going to use, the method, method we're going to use is methodological individualism. We're going to concentrate on the individual. We're going to assume that that individual is self-interested. Not selfish, but self-interested. And selfish means they are pursuing their own goals. And those goals can either be completely selfish or all kinds of other possibilities. But they pursue their own goals. And we, we should expect them to be, to be rational, self-interested individuals operating inside of government, operating outside of government, operating anytime we're voting. We are the same people. And uh, unlike Bob Higgs, I'm not quite willing to argue for no government, but Bob's convincing. <laughs> uh, I'm arguing that we need to restrict the scope of government to restrict the silly things that people can do. Um, we need to be realistic about our expectations of government. We should expect people in government to be doing things that we don't like. So if you read the Bob Higgs piece, he starts with the quote from Federalist 10, is it? About if men were angels, you wouldn't need government. Um, guess what? Humans are not angelic. <laughs> and if we decide we need some form of government, we, should ex we need to find ways of controlling those, those non-angelic dispositions. Actually, I worry much more about people who want to do good in government than people who are just relatively self-interested. Because when you decide that it, it ought to be done, it's a good thing. You can do all kinds of crazy things. Um, I have a slide I may show you in one of the other presentations from um, oh, his name. Anyway, the big guy in Penn and Teller. <laughs> yeah, Penn Jillette. He said, when I was a young radical, 
I was angry at all of those evil people in government. As I've gotten older, I've recognized that it's worse, much worse. They're good people. They're trying to do good things. And that's why we go to war, is to try and do good things. That's why we do all kinds of things in the name of doing good. And the fact that benefits are concentrated, costs are dispersed, that there isn't a market test to tell you if it's a good idea or a bad idea, means that you're not going to act like my father does, but you are going to operate in a much less constrained world and do lots of things that I think make the world a worse place. So when we think about democratic politics, let's recognize that democratic politics is an intense competition for power by means of votes among contending politicians, voters, interest groups, and bureaucrats. And the title of my book that uh, the Independent Institute publishes is called is Beyond Politics. It talks about all of this. This is essentially chapter three from that book. It's what we just did. Um, but the purpose of writing the book, the purpose of talking about these ideas is to recognize that there's a whole bunch of stuff that ought to be beyond the reach of politics. Much of what people think government can do, it can't do it very well and normally makes us worse off. So, um, well, in my next talk, we're going to talk about public goods and market failure as a, as a preview uh, normally. Government responses to market failure make things worse. So, thank you.